Welcome to part three of my tutorial series on MOT salvaging, where I show you how to turn broken microwaves into cool projects. If you've just come across this video, obviously it's part three, so go watch parts one and two first, or you'll be lost. They explain how to tear down a microwave and its transformer the easy way, and how to get the numbers you'll need before you start making a new coil and putting it back together. In this video, we cover some prep work, coil winding, and the final reassembly. Prep work and repairs. Take out your core in the primary and inspect it. If you have a few laminations that splintered off and the damage is mild, just glue it and clamp them back together to dry. Else, just rip them off. If you have leftover varnish on the inside of the core walls, you can chisel or file or sand it smooth. It's not necessary, but it'll help your coils slide on later, especially if they're tight. Next, inspect your primary for damages you may have inflicted on it in a moment of frustration while trying to extract it. If there are scratches or gouges, try to isolate them from other wires and then paint them with fingernail polish or glue or something so they don't short. Lay the windings back down and glue a snippet of paper over that edge or hide your failures with a piece of tape. Next, if it matters, you should be able to tell by the weight if your primary is aluminum or copper. Most are copper. Aluminum will seem very light in comparison. Both can be any color on the outside, so if you want to be sure, cut one of the terminals off and see if the wire is copper or aluminum colored through the inside. Aluminum is 40% less conductive, so it will carry only 60% of the max amperage of copper the same size. This may matter for your project. Sometimes aluminum primary wire is oversized to compensate, but not always. And unless you feel like wrapping a whole new primary or finding another microwave, there's nothing you can do about it. Your new secondary does not have to match the material of the primary. You can wrap whatever you want regardless. Just lower your expectations if you find and decide to use aluminum. Then consider your application. MOTs are built cheap and inefficient. They waste 20% of their power and if you're keeping the magnetic shunts out, they'll waste a whole lot more and even need a fan running constantly to cool them unless you make some upgrades. This only matters if your project is limited by transformer heat or duty cycle, which many high power devices will be, or if your home circuit is being maxed out, which it might be, or if the MOT will be in continuous use and a couple hundred extra watts all day would noticeably impact your power bill. If you do want to do something about it, no other tutorials mention this, and it's not necessary, but you can cut that waste heat by about 85% if you simply add extra turns to the primary. Up to 30 extra turns will yield noticeable improvements, but even 10 to 15 extra can eliminate the majority of that loss. But note that doing so has the following chain reaction of side effects. First, it changes the number of turns on the primary so it will lower the voltage on the secondary unless you compensate by adding more turns there as well. Second, a bigger primary usually means less room for the secondary. Third, because the secondary now needs more turns and has less space to put them in, your wire size has to shrink. Fourth, those thinner wires can't carry as many amps without overheating, which is what we were upgrading to avoid. The trade-off is generally beneficial, so I suggest you add extra turns if you have the ability. Otherwise, this is one of those situations where you might want to put the shunts back in between the coils. They kind of compensate for it in a different and inferior way. The primary's wire will generally be 14 or 16 gauge, and if you're careful, you can just cannibalize another MOT primary for wire and solder it together. If you have another MOT project where you're not reusing the primary, that would be a good candidate. To add extra turns, you'll need to find a terminal that's connected to the outside winding on the coil. Join the new wire to the old one and continue wrapping in the same direction. You can cut that terminal off and twist the wires together, but it's easier to just solder your new wire onto the old terminal. To do so, you'll need a source of heat like a soldering iron gun or a lighter and some solder. Even though the wire looks bare, it's not. It's covered in enamel insulation. You need to sand or scrape off the last inch for the wire to conduct. I find it's easiest to add solder to the terminal and wire separately first, so you only need to reheat it later. 
When the wires are joined, continue coiling in the same direction. If you have extra space between the coil and core, you can fill that first before creating a new row or two. More on how to coil coming up soon. When you're done, cut the wire and cover the old terminal with tape, glue, or silicone. The new wire end replaces the old terminal. Speaking of wires, you have three options for wires. You can use enameled wire, you can use normal hookup wire that you purchase by length at the big home stores, or you can use bare wire and insulate it yourself. The best option and the only option for smaller or high voltage wires is enameled wire because the insulation only adds 5% to its size. But most of you will have to buy it and the heavier stuff you can only find in electric motor repair shops. Even if you can salvage it, using recycled wire is risky, especially for high voltage, because cracks and scrapes in the enamel are hard to spot and will allow electricity to short and arc in the windings. If you're going to go this route and you do find any scratches, touch them up with fingernail polish first. The next best, especially for thick wire, is to buy or salvage bare wire or strip some junk wire and then cover it with either heat shrink tubing or Teflon tape. This is actually cheaper than buying insulated wire and better. You'll want to buy your heat shrink on a roll, not the cut up six inch pieces, and it only costs about 20 cents a foot from your favorite auction website. Put the heat shrink on before you coil it. Heat shrink is good for 125 degrees Celsius and it's much thinner than the insulation on hookup wire. Heat shrink might only double the bulk of your wire. Teflon tape is in the plumbing aisle. Half inch wide is the most common, but buy the widest you can find. It'll mean a lot less wrapping and fewer bending issues. When you Teflon wrap, overlap at least half the previous turn, both for thickness and so gaps won't appear when you bend it around a corner. As a last, but sadly most common resort, you can use hookup wire. The insulation is so thick that you can reuse old wire from commercial renovations or wherever without much worry. Just make sure you measure on top of the insulation when sizing and don't just read what it says for the copper size or your wire won't fit. But here's why it's troublesome. These are two coils that I'm rather proud of. They're tightly wrapped and they fill the core just about completely. But if you do the math, even though my fill rate is about 65%, if you only consider the useful copper conductor, it's not even 20% filled. That's turning, for example, a 1000 watt transformer into one that can only support 200 watts on a continual basis without overheating, even when fan cooled. The insulation more than triples the size of the wire. That means a bunch of bad things. Number one, I'm wasting most of the size of this transformer. Number two, my copper conductors aren't nearly as thick as they could be and they'll overheat much quicker. Number three, the low temp insulation tends to melt itself. And four, the insulation is so thick it prevents the copper from cooling. But just know the limitations and use what's available. For intermittent use projects that need high power pulses with long breaks in between, like some welders, Hookup wire can be okay, but it wouldn't be appropriate for a battery charger or inside a stereo, something that stays on for a long period of time. When wire sourcing, pick whatever has the thinnest and highest temp insulation, all else equal. For low voltage purposes, insulation only needs to prevent the copper from touching, so any wire that's not outright bare has plenty. Remember, you have a total max wire size, including insulation, but for us, anything thicker than paint is useless. You want as much of it to be copper as possible. To estimate how much wire you need, make one big loop out of string or scrap wire, measure its length, and multiply it by the number of loops you need, then add a couple feet for hookup. That's estimating high, but you don't want to end up short. If you're too lazy to estimate, it's about one foot per loop, but don't complain to me if you run short. If you have trouble getting thick enough wire, but have lots of wire, say, two thirds as thick, just wrap two identical thinner coils and connect them in parallel. It's analogous to kneading a 2x4 but using a pair of 1x4s glued to each other. As long as the coils have the correct turns count, you can stack up as many as you can fit. Once you've got your wire, you're ready to wind it. Now, if you didn't separate the E and I pieces, you're going to have to thread your wire all the way through, back and forth each time, and you're going to struggle to get it all in square and laying flat. When it starts getting tight, you can use a screwdriver to help squeeze the last few turns in. It's not so bad for the very low voltage projects, but for higher voltage ones, it can become practically impossible. For example, if you had even just a 60 volt secondary, 
you'd be pulling through 60 feet, then 59 and a half feet back just to get one turn in, then 59 feet and 58 and a half back to get the second turn. By the time you're done, you'll have threaded 1,800 feet of wire. Higher voltages are even worse. For example, the original 2,000 volt secondary would have had you pulling a million feet of wire. And even if you could do it, the wire would have snapped from being work hardened and the insulation would have been scraped away to nothing. It's not so bad for small voltages, but trust me, just spend the 10 bucks on a hacksaw and do it the easy way. Everyone with their core disassembled will want to make a spool or bobbin to coil the wire on before transferring the coil to the transformer. To make a bobbin, first measure the center column of the core. Add a couple millimeters to the internal measurement so that your core doesn't end up too tight and add at least a pencil's worth to each side of the external measurement, if not more like a half inch. The extra space outside will prevent the corners from rounding and will double the cooling. Then measure the height of the available space and cut this block out of some scrap wood like a 2x4. If you don't have any scrap wood, go to a place that sells lumber and find their cut room. Ask if they'll give you some scrap. Next, you'll need sides. Cut them out of plywood and make them about a quarter inch oversized. If you don't have any scrap plywood, try the cut room again, or maybe sacrifice a dollar store clipboard for science. If you want to get fancy, cut a piece for a handle and buy a couple of long bolts, some lock washers, nuts, more scrap wood, and use them to create a winch, like this. Then you're ready to start wrapping. The most important thing when wrapping is to make sure your wires are tightly packed and straight through the core. Outside the core surrounded by air doesn't matter as much, but inside the core needs to be perfect. If it's not, you won't be able to fit all your turns in. Note you want to attempt hexagonal packing, laying each new layer into the previous groove, not square packing where the gaps are slightly larger. Before you start, put some thin cardboard strips or tape on the outside edges to prevent the coil from shifting when you're done. If your project doesn't have an exact voltage and thereby turns target, mark on your bobbin where the edge of the core will be so you'll know where you'll have to stop. Add a notch or a screw and wrap the wire on it to anchor it, and begin wrapping from the outside. For thicker wire, counterintuitively make sure you kink each wire at the corner outward with your thumb before it passes through the core again so that it lays flat. You can pull as hard as you want like this, but unless you kink it, it'll always bulge in the middle. Make sure all your core passes are horizontal, not angled, or you'll lose a row every layer and the wire will bunch up. Instead, make all your angle changes on the outside, right where you started. When you're done, slap a big piece of duct tape on the outside of the coil so it doesn't shift on you, 
Then tape down the cardboard strips. Unscrew and slide off one side of the bobbin, holding the coil in your hands in case it tries to spring. Hold the coil on the edges with your fingers and push the rest of the bobbin out. Now would be a good time to zip tie the coil or add extra tape. You might even want to ask for help so you never have to let it go. If the coil shifts on you, you won't get it back together tight and you'll be inventing new curse words starting over. Be careful when test fitting the new secondary. Insulation rips and cuts very easily on the corners of the core. If you've done everything correctly, the coil should fit onto the core. If not, Either your math was wrong, or your measurements were wrong, or you lacked basic motor skills. Either way, you'll have to choose whether to accept the lower voltage of however many loops did fit, or start over. But before starting over, here's a couple things to try. First, if you can see that the problem is that the coil is too rounded, try crushing the coil slightly with a wood-lined vise, or mallet, a little at a time, and see if you can get it to fit better. Second, if you have to take off a layer of windings, try clamping the core back together and threading as many extra as you can through whatever gaps you can find. If everything fits, you're ready to reassemble. If you have room, glue some cardstock like this to the inside of the core to help insulate. If you're using enameled wire, always do this. It doesn't matter which way you put the coils on, but most of the time I like to have the terminals of the secondary on the opposite side of the primary. Generally, my power plug goes out the back and whatever the project does happens up front, but another reason I do it is that I like to keep the terminals away from each other so they can't short. To reassemble the core, the E and I pieces have to be touching. They don't require an electrical connection since the transformer is a magnetic device, but they do need to fit back together with no air gap. The best way to lock the core back together, if you have a welder, is to tack weld the four corners. Don't try to re-weld the whole seam, it doesn't help and will cause problems with eddy currents. If you don't have a welder, and I'm guessing most of you won't, just use some silicone, goop, zip ties, or hose clamps. As long as it's touching, it doesn't matter. The only problem if you don't get it solid enough is noise. Remember this? Even after you secure the core, the coils will also rattle, so it's a good idea to secure them with wood or cardboard shims. Old transformers used to be submerged in beeswax when they were complete to hold everything in place. Modern transformers are usually vacuum pressed or dipped in several coats of varnish. Securing all surfaces with silicone works well too. This not only cuts down on the noise, it'll prevent the coils from scraping and shorting out. And there you have it, everything you needed to know to turn a recycled microwave oven transformer into a high power transformer of your own design. Before you junk the microwave, take everything else off of it. Most of it will come in handy for future projects. Today, we will dissect the microwave. First, make an incision here, and then here, and then here. Then, we will extract the brains! Power cord, fan, and switches are needed for almost every project. The cap, magnet, triac, optocoupler, relay, motor, feet, and even the sheet metal in the frame can come in handy for others. Now that you know how to build your own transformer, you're ready to make all kinds of fun, high-power projects. First up in my next video is an easy and popular one, a spot welder.